are you the person who loves the auditions then? I've learned to love them. I think before, if I'm being honest, sometimes the anxiety of like the preciousness of the audition, you know, because it, it is an opportunity and sometimes we see it as like, oh my gosh, this is my chance to get a job. I have really had to change my mindset entirely and be like, look, if I look at my track record, 99.9% of the auditions I go for, I've been rejected. If we want to put it in those terms, I did not get those jobs. It's just part of the business, and that's totally fine. So I look at it as more of an opportunity to be able to do what I love. And I'm not precious about it anymore. So when I get an audition, I just want to be excited about it because it's a chance for me to be able to do what I love. Talent Talk is sponsored by Company of Rogues Actors Studio, New York-style training for actors at all stages of their journey. With our part-time classes and full-time masterclass program, Rogues provides a unique post-secondary option under the guidance of working professionals. Mentoring and developing professional film and theater artists since 1993, Calgary's longest-running independent studio offers practical hands-on classes in a positive, supportive environment. Check us out at corogues.com. Company of Rogues, passionate about the art of acting. Hey everybody, I'm Gary McLean. You're watching Talent Talk. Thanks for tuning in. If you haven't done so already, please do go to the Talent Talk YouTube channel and subscribe today. As always, the support's appreciated. And also a reminder that this and previous episodes are available on podcast mediums such as Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts. Essentially, wherever you listen to your podcast is probably there. So please check it out. Now, I also have sponsors for this, our fifth season, which I'm very excited about. It's the first season we've been able to bring in some sponsors, and they have helped us immensely. So I need to give them a quick shout out. So here we go. We have Six Degrees Sound and Music, who actually does our in-studio, in-person audio recording and editing. Now, this is a remote session, so they're not necessarily involved, but they've been supportive nonetheless. And then we have Workflow Film, who actually does our film recording and editing for those in-person in studio sessions and then we have company of rogues which is a calgary local acting studio and school we have rj talent which is a local talent agent here in calgary uh, we have heard of one media counting coup indigenous film academy and finally we have actra alberta so thank you to those fine folks for helping us out this season you have helped elevate us to another level and it is extremely appreciated now, today's guest, I was hoping to chat a little bit about some of her uh, more, um, shall we say, uh, streamlined works recently, but uh, due to the strike, we're going to hold off on that. But she's also a repeat guest. We've had her on, and I think it was in season two, and it uh, seems to be the theme this year, where we're bringing in some folks that we've previously had on. Uh, and I'm super excited to have her back on because she's done so much more since we've last chatted. Uh, but we're going to chat a little bit about some of her personal projects and a couple of short films she's been in, as well as maybe some of, uh, you know, just acting in general and, and find out more about the industry. So please join me in welcoming Yvonne Chapman to the show. Hello. Hi. Hello. I'm so happy to be back. <laughs> yes. And I'm, I'm happy to have you back. So thank you. <laughs> oh, thanks for having me. I, I just want to say that I am getting over... Um, a start of bronchitis, so I'm going to do oh. my best off the cough. So if, it, if I do, I, I sincerely apologize to everybody to hear to have to hear that. So. <laughs> oh well, that's not good. How, how long have you, like, how long did you kind of have it? Um, I was out for like a good week. It was it was not fun. Um, yeah, but it, I'm totally fine now. It's just like the the after effects, you know. So my voice is a little bit scratchy still, and coughing here and there, but. I don't know. I got I got some coffee beside me. I got some water. I'm good to go. <laughs> Perfect. Well, if it becomes too much and you have to have a little fit, just let me know and we'll, we'll sidetrack. <laughs> okay, sounds good. <laughs> Perfect. Well, so what have you been up to? Like, uh, I think, like I said, season two, I think, was the last time we kind of had you on the show, and that was back in, uh, what, 2020, maybe? Oh, wow. So, yeah. Yeah. Really yeah. Oh, my gosh. Season two of Talent Talk. You guys have come a long way. I've really enjoyed... Um, your episodes and what you've done. I think it's fantastic. Well, 
So congratulations so on that. Yeah. Um, hey, I just been, you know, same, same, just out in Vancouver, uh, auditioning a ton. Uh, luckily got a couple projects and now I'm just more focused, um, especially during this quiet time on trying to create my own things and getting back to some really lovely independent work um, with some really good friends. So, Yeah. And actually, yeah. in fact, I think you, you did a short film uh, called The Stranger. Mm -hmm. And uh, interestingly enough, and I'm not sure if you're aware of this or not, but we actually had one of those other folks that was in there with you. Curtis, um, yeah. On, uh, yeah, earlier this season. So yeah. um, it's always kind of fun when I can tie those together. <laughs> So. Yeah, I, that's so lovely. I love Curtis. He's great. And, you know, him and I actually met on something that, God, I think it was probably, if not the first, maybe the second thing I ever booked. And that's where I met him. Is we were on that same project together way back in the day, like, I think eight years ago or something like that. And um, since then, we just kept in touch. We always see see each other on other projects. And then he approached me with this project because he was producing it or helping to produce it. And he said, I think you'd be really good um, for this role. And we, I, we've always wanted to work together again. So it was really nice to be able to do that. Um, and I just I just love that feel of, of like the short films, the indie community again. Like that's the stuff that I, I started out with, you know, when like I, I just wanted experience on the set and just, but now it, it, it's uh, more than that. It's just being able to work with your friends again and seeing how all of us have really grown and developed um, in creating things. And it's so yeah. nice to have it, just to be there and help each other out. It's a different vibe, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about the film itself and, and your role within it. Yeah, like. sure. Um, so the two leads are is Curtis and I. And it's navigating a relationship that goes under a wild change. So I don't want to give away too much. I'm not even sure like what Andy, who's the, the writer, director of the film, would want me to say. But I can say that it's this wild change that happens in these two characters' uh, relationship. And they have to navigate that. And so that's what you're seeing throughout this whole short. And it's a change that's really unexpected that nobody saw coming and it's just it really speaks to how couples or people deal with the diversity of something that they've known and are very comforted in for a very long time um when that has a seismic shift how do you deal with it how do you even recognize it anymore is it something that's recognizable is it something that you adapt to do you steer away from the change because you're so used to the comfortability of what it is, um, it, it really speaks to a lot of, I think, parallels in just everyday relationships as well. You know, as people grow and evolve, how, do you grow and evolve with it? Do you stay the same? How how does that all look like? And I think it addresses a lot of those issues, not just within personal relationships, but relationships that you might have even with your environment, with the city, with a place, anything that transforms and, and gives way to change, how does someone deal with that change? And that's what it's this short explores. Okay, and how, how long is the film itself? Uh, I believe recall. it is, oh gosh, I want to say it's around, I think the 10 minute mark. I should oh. know that. Yeah. Yeah, you know. I've watched it so many yeah. times, but I never, I never pay attention to the actual time of it. Do you know what I mean? Right. Like, I never have it down packed like it is this, this long. Um, I just watch it and it is long, as long as it needs to be. <laughs> Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Well, so the interesting thing, of course, with, with short films, like you said, you get to work with your friends again and people you haven't worked with maybe for a while. Um, and so I'm assuming you were just approached, like you said, and he's like, hey, I think you'd be great for this. Now that you've had a few years' experience in, in kind of the, the higher echelon, if you will, of film and TV, uh, do you do you find that people approach you? Or are you still having to, to do that grind of constant auditions? And I still do the grind of auditions a lot, a lot, yeah. a lot, a lot. Um, and I really don't mind it. I, I still love reading for the roles because it gives me a sense of, one, it, it keeps us working, right? Auditions are work. And it keeps the practice going and the flow going, um, especially during, you know, times where you're just like, ah, you know, I just want to try something different. And, and I think auditions allow you to actually work and, and to do that work in so many different forms and, and roles. Um, 
I would say it's quite, it's a balance of people approaching and then people not. And I think it's a really nice lesson that the relationships that you cultivate, you know, in this industry or or just, you know, in general, the long, the more you effort you put in and the longer uh, you, the longer you go at this, I think that just comes naturally. You know, you develop a rapport with people, you develop relationships, friendships with people, and naturally you just want to work together. So I think the longer you stay in this game and, and, you know, you're really with the intent of wanting to be able to work with your friends and to create fun things, that's just naturally going to happen over, over the years in, in my experience and with, from what I hear from other people's experience as well, you know. Right. I, I agree with you, though. Like, it is work. Um, mm-hmm. And I know some, like, I've talked to a few different actors as well. Some people hate auditions. Some people love auditions. Um, are you the person who loves the auditions then? I've learned to love them. I think before, if I'm being honest, sometimes the anxiety of, like, the preciousness of the audition you know, because it, it is an opportunity and sometimes we see it as like, oh my gosh, this is my chance to get a job. I really had to change my mindset entirely and be like, look, if I look at my track record, 99.9% of the auditions I go for, I've been rejected. If we want to put it in those terms, I did not get those jobs. I, it's just part of the business and that's totally fine. So I look at it as more of an opportunity to be able to do what I love. And I'm not precious about it anymore. So when I get an audition, I just want to be excited about it because it's a chance for me to be able to do what I love and to work. It's yeah. I look at it the same as, you know, even classes where you're doing scene work and you get a scene and then you put it up the next week. It's no different to me. That I, I need to put as much effort as I am putting in those auditions to my classes, to whatever it is. And I just see it as an opportunity to, to be able to act. Um, so going back to your question, I've learned to really love the audition process. And before it, it was not so much so, but before it gave me quite a little bit of anxiety, <laughs> right. you know? Yeah. Well, and I think, yeah, I think the anxiety part, and this is going to lead to a different question as well, but I think the anxiety part, I don't, I think it gets easier over time. But it's still always there. There's always that lingering anxiety. Now, the question I have for you in relation to that is because the majority of our auditions now are um, self-tape, mm-hmm. right? In comparison to in-person, um, do you find in-person would be still more stressful or do you find the self-tape mm. relieve some of that or... That's a good question. You know, I actually do think the self-tape releases some of that anxiety only because, um, you know, you can do it in a setting that suits you at any time, as long as you're getting it before the deadline. You know, you, you have more control over over the end product, I believe. I will say I do miss in-person interaction and being able to have that direct feedback from a casting director. I really do miss having that face-to-face time and I I personally think that if it's a callback situation for example I would love to be in the room and to be there with with people who are involved with the project just so we can get it from a different stage from the first read um but for the self-tape I actually quite enjoy it actually um I'm not one of those people and I suggest for other people too. I'm not one of those people who do like a thousand takes <laughs> for each scene. I don't think that helps anybody. I think you lose some of the magic of the spontaneity that happens um, that you want to see within a performance. So I'm not like that, but I do like the I, I do like the flexibility that it lends for right. self taping. You know, I, I think that allows me to be able to do a little bit more with it actually. Um, than I would in, in the in-room. In the in-room, you kind of feel like maybe it's, you know, you're in a time constraint and you only have so much room and so much time to be able to get in there and do your thing and get out. Whereas I think in the self-tape, you have a little bit more leeway to be able to play around. Right. Yeah, no, that's fair. Yeah. Um, I don't know how you feel, if that's what your experience as well, but... Yeah, and like you, I, I try not to do too many takes because like you said, after a while, just you become numb to the the lines almost Mm -hmm. Um, but what I found and again I guess it's kind of another question is um, 
how, how often have you done like Zoom callbacks? I've done a couple. Um, yeah, I've done a couple, and the Zoom ones. I I'll be I'll be honest. I'm I will do them because it's just any opportunity again to be able to do what we what we can absolutely i do find them strange though especially when there's like technical issues or hiccups like especially if it's an emotional scene i find those like oh man i gotta do this through screen i can do it but it's not the ideal situation especially when you're trying to connect and you can see you know the reader you're like wait where are they and then maybe there's like other things going off that it's just so distracting but hey like it's it's another challenge and it's all about the reframing of the mindset of just like, how are you going to look at, uh, look at this? Are you going to go in with uh, an attitude being like, oh, you know, this isn't ideal. I don't, this is going to be tough or just take it on as a fun challenge and see what happens. Yeah. Um, yeah. To me, it's like, it's all good. As long as, as long as people are still wanting to see me, <laughs> that's all I really care about at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Like, I think I have an audition tomorrow, which is the first one since be well before Great. the strike. Nice. So yeah, I'm kind of excited good about luck. that. Uh, sorry? Good luck. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. yeah, so I, I have, I've had one Zoom call. Well, actually, I've had a couple Zoom callbacks, but I remember this one that I had, and it was... I think I was probably more stressed than I'd ever been in an audition to do that mm -hmm. Zoom callback. But I think I shot myself in the foot because uh, I had my lines ready. I was good to go, but I had about 30 minutes left before I was supposed to get online. Oh, and I thought, in that time, okay, fine. So I started to look up you know, who the producers were, who the directors were, see what they've done. Um, and they were all like, they had all been involved in like major projects, uh, especially in the UK, and shows that I had watched and loved. And so then I, th I think I got into my own head, of oh man, I really need to impress these people, right? right, right. <laughs> and then I screwed the entire thing. But <laughs> obviously, I'm didn't sure get the you didn't screw it up as much as you think. It's yeah, it's I mean yeah, it's always worse in your own mind, definitely. Um, but obviously, not enough to actually get the part. So. Um, but I, I do know the fellow who did get the role and uh, very happy for him because he, mm -hmm. yeah, he's a good actor. So it deserves it. Yeah. yeah, good. Yeah, I mean, that's a tough thing, right? It's like they always say go in armed with as much knowledge as you can. I purposely, honestly, I'll, I'll look at it after, but for after, audition, yeah. for audition purposes, I don't, I try to not look up the producers, what they've done. You know, I, I just, I look up as much as I can and get ready for the story. And then anything beyond that, I'll, I'll, I'll learn after. But for me, like, like you said, I don't want to get my head in my head about like, you know, cause I, I can fangirl too. Like, I think like, oh God, they've done this and that. And I absolutely love that project. I'd love to be a part of that. And for me, I'm like, that's, that doesn't help. It's not, it's not about that. I need to get the job done in terms of the acting bit and what's going to help me there is just like really deep dive into that story and that character and then everything else you can you can look at after but I, i'm the same i'm like i can't touch that stuff <laughs> yeah no so learn my lesson there yes yeah. look at it yeah. after <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah no i i, I find I, I as well kind of miss the in-person ones um because again it's, yeah, it's just that interaction of because when you send in the self tape, even if you if you do it in three takes or ten takes, you really have no idea, right? Mm -hmm. So you send it in. At least when you're in the room, you can look at that person and read body language or just take their their words, right, and and absorb it and and try and work with it. But you have none of that with with the self tapes, and I find that's it's yeah, almost anticlimactic <laughs> if you will yeah yeah it's a tricky thing but you know i i always go back to the saying that what misses you was never meant for you and what's meant for you will never miss you and even in the self tapes i have a lot of trust in the casting directors and their eye for for what they're looking for that even if the read isn't exactly what they wanted there's enough there in your essence of who you are as a person, as an actor that's coming through for them to take a second look or for them to say, you know what, 
maybe it's not quite there yet, but I'll send the notes to retape or I'll bring them in. Um, it's really about just having that trust and that, that faith that, you know, if I'm right for this role, I will hear something. And I don't know about you, but sometimes you just know, sometimes you read something you're like, okay, this probably isn't mine, but I'm going to give a crack at it anyway. And it's, I'm going to have a lot of fun doing it. Or there's ones like, oh yeah, this is, this is my, this is my dude. Like <laughs> totally. I'm going to hear totally. something from, you know, you just know yourself instinctually as well. And I think we have to also know that casting directors know that too. And, and they're seeing us for a reason. So the other short film I wanted to bring up first, which was dragon fruit, which is kind of a post apocalyptic thing. Um, yeah. Because that's, you know, I've, I've seen your work. I know what you can do, all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's a little bit, of, you know, to me, I, I wouldn't normally foresee you in that care, that kind of role. Um, mm -hmm. But I, based on the trailer, because I did watch the trailer, um, you know, it looks amazing. I'd, I'd love to check it out. Um, but how do you how do you get into that mindset for the, the character that you were actually doing for that, for example? Yeah, that was what was really appealing to me is because it was something that I've never done yet um professionally you know um i think we you and i and i don't rem i can't quite recall in our first talk but i think maybe in personal discussions anyway that you and i have that it's so much of our acting is only shown of what we actually get to do you know the auditions that are the graveyard of auditions no one's going to be able to see those but it's a like our body of work speaks to just what we've been actually been hired, right? And sometimes what's really appealing about these short films and, and collaborating with friends is that you get to choose your own thing of what, and you get to show what it is that you, what else you can do. And so my friend, Jeremy Brown, who wrote, directed, um, and produced the film, when he approached me with it, I'm like, yeah, this sounds really different from anything that I've done. Um, and that's what really appealed to me. And I think, you know, in getting into any character to answer your question, it really just comes down to what can I relate to with this character? And there's, it, it comes down just to the humanity of it. Like, what have I personally experienced or what have I observed that would allow me to have an in into this person? Um, and that's always the answer for me is what is my in? And, and for her, you know, she's someone who was really struggling, trying to work really hard, um, that was told a story that if she did A, B, and C, that she'll get X, Y, and Z. And it just it doesn't really happen, not to give anything away, but that's kind of the crux of the story. Um, and I think that's a very universal, relatable experience for a lot of people um, that in some certain stances, one way or another, we really go for something and put in a sweat equity and it doesn't turn out how we were told it would or how we expected it and it's managing those expectations um yeah yeah okay and, and so it, it's still along that line uh when it comes to say character development or you know mm -hmm. trying to figure out how you want to approach it um do you people watch to get ideas of certain characters all the time yes all the time i do i every day gary every day like it is one of my all-time favorite pastime. I look. I'm a creep. I'll just like go to a coffee shop and then just sit there and watch. And like, ah, God, I don't even know if I should be saying this, but look, I don't post anything or anything like that. And then if I want to, I'll like go up to the person and be like, Hey, I took this photo of you. Do you mind if I like send it to you? Are you okay with that? But there's just these beautiful captured moments that I find um, in just sitting and observing people that I'm like, ah. Oh, that's what I want to see. And that's what I want to do. Right. I don't know if, if you've experienced that, but it's, and it's never the big crazy things. I think the things that are the most relatable and palatable and transferable to people when they're watching, especially, and I'm speaking for myself as an audience member, are those little moments of humanity where if they're almost kind of forgotten as a sideline, but for me, they speak far louder than anything big destroy right. all you know what I mean um so that's what I really love about the people watching and I always get ideas from that always it's yeah daily occurrence <laughs> okay and I think the majority of you know people do kind of people watch to a certain extent 
it's just as an actor, we tend to take those visuals and use it later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. So do you, I, I know I, I've, especially in my earlier days, I've been guilty of this. I don't know if you ever have or what your thoughts are on it, but um, if I had an audition and I, the character breakdown is similar to somebody else I may be seen in a different movie, have you ever kind of referred to that movie for conceptual ideas on how sometimes. to build that character? Yeah, sometimes. I think I, I'm of two minds about it. I think I'm quite stubborn in the fact that if it reminds me of something else, I'll refer to it for physical ideas. So I find that, let me rephrase this, I find that for certain descriptions, if it's, let's say, like an action part, you know, and they, they need to see some kind of physicality within the audition, I'll definitely take up some references to see. Um, or inspired by other work, absolutely. But I am quite stubborn in the fact that, like, well, I, ca I can't just be a copycat. It has to come from me in some other way. And I know when I look at my own work and my tapes, if I'm putting on an impersonation of something else, I hate it. And that's just like my personal um, taste in what I do. So I definitely will look for inspiration for other things, but then I got to rework it in some other way to make it more of my own. Right. So have you done characters where you, you're actually portraying somebody real? No, but I would actually love to. I think that would be such a fantastic challenge because, um, and I think that's a very different thing from, you know, portraying a character of somebody else's version of a character. Yeah, for Does sure. Absolutely. Sense? Yeah. I mean, there's there's so many nuances here because you can also look at the adaptations of cartoon characters and you got a brain like you, you have to stay true to that vein. But that's to me like going from like a cartoon to a live action. There's something really beautiful in that and being able to embody that kind of character versus uh, let's say it's a, a biopic, I would absolutely love to study that. I think that is really integrating and stepping into a wholly different skin. Yes. Um, and I would love to have that challenge of that kind of work. And it's funny that you say that because people have asked me like, oh, what's something that you want to do next? And I said, I would love to try a biopic. Okay. Just to yeah. give myself a challenge to see if I could really embody somebody else while still having the delicate balance of bringing a little bit of myself into that too. So like the two worlds really kind of just kind of mix and combine, you know? Um, but yeah, I, I, in my mind, it's, it's quite a distinction between emulating something um, that's already there to stay true to that essence of, of that character, whether it be adapting something from live action or adapting into a biopic versus this is a new character wholly entirely. And not imitating somebody else's version and placing it on them. Right. If that makes sense. Yeah. 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 Do you have a favorite, uh, shall we say, um, character type that you like to play that you have played so far? Oh, I, I don't know if I have a favorite type. I think I just always like characters that have just more to them than what's on the surface. Always. You know, like, I think that's such a generic answer and I apologize, but it's true. It's just, you always want something that you can just dig a little bit deeper into that the words on the page aren't just the words on the page. It's, I always say the, the answers are in the white. It's not in the black of the page, you know, like the words are the words, but then find something else underneath there. And that's where the real, for me, where the, the real fun begins. Um, right. So as long as the character gives me that, I'm, I'm totally happy and stoked no matter what. And that's why, as where I was kind of going with that is, um, for example, playing the bad guy, because that's where, I, I don't know, it seems to me a lot, a lot of the bad guys that are on TV or bad girls, if you will, um, mm -hmm. are, you know, they always have that underlying layer. And that's where yeah. the fun kind of is, right? Because you kind of, yeah. on the surface, you're seeing this person, they're, they're badass or they're just trouble. But then there's always that underlying reason of why they're like that, right? Whereas, you know, you tend to have the, the good guys, if you will, the good girls, and they're more generic a lot of times. Not all the time. There's some really good ones out there, but for the most part, I find they're 
almost generic. And that's why I think it's kind of fun to play the bad guy because you have those layers that you can play with and build upon. Fair enough. I will say, yeah, I think um, I do enjoy playing the baddie <laughs> for sure. And I think that's exactly the reason why. Um, I think too, though, the good guys, I think what makes a villain is just the difference between how you deal with pain. A hero takes pain and says, I don't want anyone else to deal with that. The villain says, I take pain and everyone else is going to pay for it. Right. You know, and, and both of them are both rooted in some kind of hurt. And I think, you know, even if you did play the hero, the good guy, there's still a lot of room to try to play with something like that. It doesn't always have to be righteous or virtuous. It, there's other ways to show that, you know, sometimes morality lives in a very gray area. Um, and again, it, it really comes down, though, to the writing if it allows for that. One last question I'll kind of ask is, how do you how do you balance your acting life with your personal life? Do you take time oh. for yourself? Do you take time for your family? Yeah, um, definitely. Um, acting life and personal life, I mean if I'm being completely honest, like sometimes it just bleeds into another because I think a lot of the times when you have a really, in my opinion, when you try to have a really fulfilling personal life, it really helps with the work. And I, I don't want to say that, oh, I, I really need to like focus on this stuff because then I'm going to be a better actor for a little, that's terrible. But, you know, at the end of the day, I, I just, I think it's more of a, I guess, advertisement to say, don't put everything into your work all the time. You know, do have those moments and time to take care of yourself, to take care of the people around you who really matter, who support you, who uplift you and do the same for them. That's really important in all your friendships and your family. Um, so definitely, yeah, I mean, it, it's difficult because I think a lot of the times, you know, in this business, you're kind of working as 24 seven, um, what's next, what's next, what do I look for, uh, for the next thing? I know a lot of people who become really run down too, because there is just like this need and perpetual motion of like, we can't stop the second we stop, it's all going to go away. And you wonder where does, where does that come from? So it's a question of like, where does that come from? Who told us that? And what do we need to fix here? Because it's not sustainable after a while. I don't know. I, I, I would love to hear your thoughts on, on how you deal with it as well, if that's something you reckon with too. Uh, definitely. Um, like, for example, you know, I, I still have my day job, for one thing. So I still do that eight hours a day. And then Talent Talk itself has kind of become my second job, where you mm -hmm. know I'm either editing till 11 o'clock at night, or I'm setting up the next interview, or whatever, right? Maintenance of the show that kind of thing. So it, it is a tough balance, um, especially when you, you do have kids. Now, luckily, mine are old enough to you know, basically live on their own if they want it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not bad that way. But still, it is a balance, right? Because, you know, if, like you said, if you're focusing on one thing solely, then something else gets ignored, right? And, and in this case, uh, sometimes it's my wife, right? And she's like, well, you're always doing this. Like, can't we do something? Right. So you, you do, you have to kind of backtrack a little bit, find that time to, to balance that out. Um, and plus, like you said, like in terms of what I'm doing now, you, you get yourself run down, you, you burn yourself out. And then you're like, why am I doing this? You know, you start to question things. And, um, so it is, like you said, it, it's, it's a tough balancing act, um, but you have to be able to be able to make that conscious decision to, to kind of look at the both sides and, and try and make that balance. Um, but yeah, it can be tough for sure. Yeah. I think a lot of it comes down to great communication too, um, between, well, one, an introspective communication with yourself so that you're always checking in with yourself and making sure that what you're doing is in service to you and to others. And also the communication with you and, you know, if you have a spouse or a partner, your family, your friends. Um, willing to have those really honest talks with each other and be like, hey, uh, gosh, I know I've been like grinding it for a really long time here. Am I, I, I let me check in with you. Am I being neglectful? Am I being a bad friend? Am I being a bad spouse? Like, and on the other side, for them to really call you out, like, I think 
that is what I really have come to value is honest, open communication with, with people um, and for them not to feel like they're stepping on eggshells all the time around around each other and me with them. I think that just lends to a really more rich and beautiful um, way of, of being with each other is to be able to like call each other out a little bit and be like, hey, I just want to check in. Or if you see your friend being burnt up, be like, are you sure you're okay? It, like reaching out to people and just having that constant uh, lifeline is really yeah. important so that we understand where that balance needs to come in. Because I don't know about you, a lot of times we can just go with blinders. It's like one thing after the next and you feel like you can't stop. And then you're on this like roller coaster ride and you can't really get off until someone has to kind of pull you off. Yeah. It happens, you know, but it's, it's just accountability with each other and, and to yourself. Absolutely. And I, I, and again, um, you're probably experiencing this more than I am, but with the strike, right, of course, you, you do have more downtime. And I don't know, again, about you, but if you're away from the, the, the creative side for too long, you, like, I almost get into a depression, right, where I'm like, mm -hmm. I need to do something creative. So then you start to focus on that, and then you, you get sidetracked on that. And, you know, that that's a rabbit hole that you can go down, right? So yeah, and then you kind of need those friends like you were saying to have that honest conversation going hey you you okay you're right yeah yeah just to make sure you're staying afloat right um yeah but. definitely i think it also comes down to i mean personally for me what's really worked as a system i can't go with the dry spell of not doing anything creatively or, or for myself um i i should say in the medium of what we work in for too long like every single day I do something and I put aside time every single day because as long as I do that, then I know that I'll feel okay doing something else and putting in time towards something else. Like it's, it's one of those things I have to create that system because I get anxiety from, from staying still. I really do. And I can't do it. Like it, that to me is a health issue. Sometimes it's just like, I, I get into my own head. I'll like go and seclude myself because I'm like, no, I got to, I got to just get away from everything and like um, really work right now. But if I did, I start to implement systems where I'm doing that every single day for as long as I need to sometimes. And then just saying like, please take me out of it. if I'm getting, <laughs> you know, to the other side of it a little bit too much. Um, and I'm rambling again, but I think you understand what I'm saying. It's like, sometimes I, I do. it needs to be in place. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, on that note, for anybody who's out there watching, listening, if yeah, you know, if you feel you're struggling with that, those kind of things, definitely reach out to friends, family. And, you know, don't be afraid to to put up that hand and say, "Hey, yeah, need some help." Yeah, please do. I think um, you know sometimes we're hesitant because you know, again, I'm speaking for myself. I don't want to be a burden on anybody. I'm worried that maybe I'm overreacting. I think I can just handle it on my own. Um, you don't need to. You know, your friends and family are there and they, they love and support you. So, yeah, just reach out a hand and say, like, this is what I'm doing right now. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think I think they're more than willing to um, to be able to to put in some time and effort with you. So, Absolutely. Well, yeah. on that note, we will wrap this up. I want to thank you so much for taking the time down in Australia to no, say thanks. hi. Yeah. <laughs> Appreciate really nice that. To Likewise. And uh, thanks. Thanks again. Thanks for folks for watching and uh, we'll, we'll see you next week. Take care.